The Dillon family has owned a large tract of land in Van Reenen for generations, since the end of the Anglo-Boer War. The land stretches out for hundreds of acres and is bordered on one side by the Wilge River. Once we entered the private gate to the property, we had to drive another distance on a dirt road to reach the owner's home. Rick emerged from his home, preceded by his five dogs that barked at attention when they saw us. Rick looked every bit the rugged South African with a ruddy complexion, full beard, and a leather bush hat atop his head. The Waterfall River Lodge is a wonderfully rustic log cabin perched on the banks of the Welch River with amazing views of the rolling hills, meandering river, and upstream waterfall. In the creaking floorboards and door hinges, the worn and patched furniture, and mismatched ceramic and glassware, I can just imagine the stories and memories this old house must contain. The kitchen, dining, and living areas have surely seen countless gatherings of family and friends. Over the years, modern amenities have been added to the kitchen, and it now contains an electric stovetop range, oven, dishwasher, and microwave, though still retains its rustic charm. The family dining room holds a weathered wooden table surrounded by heavy wooden chairs. The formal dining room is situated in a separate room and seats at least 16. The cozy living room is anchored by a fireplace with firewood piled high on either side. One can easily imagine sitting on the oversized furniture wrapped in a blanket in front of a crackling fire on a cold evening. Just off of the living room, the deck provides a 270 degree view of the surrounding area without a road or another home in sight. Staying in the lodge, we could immerse ourselves completely in the land. Apart from the peaceful river, distant hills, and the odd grazing cattle that occasionally wandered into view, there was nothing else for as far as the eye could see. Leo and I slept in the downstairs bedroom and let the children take over the upstairs master bedroom. The bathrooms were from another time period. Although it's not exactly the setup we're used to, we adapted easily and enjoyed the novelty of the old way of living. The upstairs area contained a library full of games and books that I wish I had more time to enjoy, and a pool table. The bedroom with its wooden floorboards and peaked roof reminded me a little of the bedroom that Wendy and her brothers shared in the Disney version of the story Peter Pan. When the kids were upstairs, they were in their own world, where they had the space to create their own memories of this special place. After I put them to bed and kissed them goodnight, I could hear them talking and giggling in the dark, sometimes late into the night. We spent much of our time preparing food and enjoying it together by candlelight at the massive wooden dining table. Leo and Rand, with assistance from Amber and moral support from Dean, cooked many meals on the outdoor braai. When a braai is available, our meals tend to be meat heavy. With so much practice recently, Rand has become quite proficient on the braai, and we enjoyed a steak meal of ribeye and filet one night, and grilled pork chops and chicken thighs another night. They made use of both the American-style round Weber grill and the traditional braai. Even rain couldn't damper their enthusiasm for grilling. While we were in Kenya, we had talked about learning to make chapati. With the right motivation, a little time, and access to the internet, we can figure anything out. We watched a few YouTube videos and got the basic idea. Chapati requires only three ingredients, and it's similar to Chinese green onion pancakes. Amber, Ellen, and I followed the instructions for Kenyan chapati, which might be slightly different from Indian chapati. We made a few slight modifications and turned out our first batch. It looked and tasted pretty good, especially when served with chicken curry and rice. The area around the lodge provided ample opportunity for exploration and adventure. We hiked the areas around and followed the river as far up and downstream as we pleased. It was fun to jump around on the huge river boulders. Rand and Dean liked to call it parkouring and took to kung fu poses as they leaped across the stones. We found the sand rock art that Rick told us about, though the vibrancy of the colors had diminished with age. The paintings date back to around 3,000 years ago. Leo introduced the children to fishing the smallmouth yellow fish and bass in the river. Rick lent us a fishing rod and tackle box containing various gear and lures. There was a good fishing rock just a short walk from the cabin, and Rand was determined to catch a fish. 
Leo, Rand, Amber, and Dean went fishing on several consecutive days, trying their luck at different times of the day, even waking up at 5 a.m. on Monday. They tried different baits and different locations to improve their odds. Although Rand didn't catch any fish during the week, he did get pretty good at casting and practiced the art of patience. We were hoping to have fish for dinner one night, but maybe next time. We'll see if this introduction to fishing turns into a long-time hobby for any of the children. Even with the cold weather, the kids were intent on swimming in the river. One day, we carried the inner tubes to the river and prepared to jump in. Not me, of course, because I hate swimming when the air or water is too cold. I had absolutely no intention of going in. Rand has no fear of cold weather swimming and jumped in first. Leo dutifully jumped in next and then helped Amber and Dean into the water. Ellen got her legs wet and changed her mind about going in. After swimming, we sat on the big river rocks and watched the sun go down. We enjoyed our time immensely at the Waterfall River Lodge. It felt so much like home that on most days we didn't need to, or want to, leave the lodge. During our five-day stay, we felt free and wild, far away from any pressures and responsibilities of modern-day life. Time slowed down and we lived more similarly, I imagine, to how people in the past might have lived. Once the sun went down, we relied on the fire and candles to illuminate the indoors, which forced our eyes to adjust to dimmer lighting levels. Outdoors, there was only the light of the moon and the stars to light the way. Besides shelter, food, family, and a healthy sense of adventure, there isn't much more that a person needs to live a good life.